Um, so what I'd like to do is to follow up on what Clive and Claudia said by talking a little bit more about the EU directive, but more in particular comparing it to U new US law uh, that is uh, on trade secrets. It's called the Defend Trade Secrets Act. And it's quite interesting that the EU directive and the US law were both enacted within 30 days of each other. Um, and they are very similar. In fact, the, 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 as you know, the, the topic of this session is the harmonization of trade secrets laws. And what I, what I personally find so interesting about it and about the, the, the two pieces of legislation is that the purpose of the US law was to harmonize law among the states. The purpose of the EU directive was to harmonize law amongst the EU member countries. But when you look at the two laws together, they are remarkably well harmonized themselves. Um, and I think Claudia is, is correct in that some of the EU directive is a reflection of the US, um, but in fact, the EU directive and the US law are both a reflection of international law. So if you look at the, at the very roots of um, trade secret protection, the first mention of it is sort of in the Paris Convention. Uh, the Paris Convention in um, Article 10 bis, uh, which was not part of the original convention but was added in a later revision conference in, in 1900, talks uh, about um, assuring nationals of member countries protection against unfair competition. Um, and that acts of unfair competition should be considered outlawed. The Paris Convention, in fact, never mentions the word trade secret. Um, the, but the word, uh, in fact, um, or the, the, the roots of trade secret protection are deemed to come from that. The real modern standards for trade secret protection come from the TRIPS agreement. So it's actually, if Germany, if, if uh, ThyssenKrupp wants to blame your, all of your work on something, it should blame it on the TRIPS agreement. Because what the TRIPS agreement did was it provided um, in Article 39 of, of the agreement that member states of the World Trade Organization and of the TRIPS agreement have to provide protection against unfair competition um, and that unfair competition in, includes the um, undis disclosing uh, in information that is to be deemed confidential. And it defines that information, it defines a trade secret or the obligation of member states um, as that the, the information should generally not be known, that it actually should be a secret, that it has to have commercial value, but then it also included the last element that Claudia mentioned, that it has been subject to reasonable steps under the circumstances by the person lawfully in control of the information to keep it secret. So um, as, as a result of that, uh, certainly from a US perspective, um, the notion, the idea that you have to take these steps uh, to make sure that your secret is secret, basically the steps that Claudia outlined, um, is sort of part of what we have as our established practice. We do have an established practice, but that established practice was on the basis of state law. There is a uniform state law, and those of you who studied in the United States probably all had to study and, and, and slog your way through the Uniform Commercial Code. The Uniform Commercial Code is the leading example of a uniform law. There is a commission of uniform uh, state laws that proposes laws that all states should, in fact, uh, adopt. And one of those was the Uniform T Trade Secrets Act. Actually, a uniform law is kind of just like a, a, an EU directive. Um, and uh, the Uniform Trade Secrets Act, in substance, um, is very much in conformity with, in fact, what even the new Defend Trade Secrets Act provides. But the Defend Trade, 
Secrets Act adds something that the Uniform Trade Secrets did, didn't provide. Um, under the Uniform Trade Secrets Act, the substantive law was pretty much equal, but the procedural law varied from state to state. Also, if you had to um, bring an action in the United States, and if your trade secret was stolen and it was now being implemented in four states in the United States, you had to bring four lawsuits. What the Defend Trade Secrets Act does is it allows you to bring one, uh, one lawsuit, one cause of action um, in a federal court as opposed to a state court that will provide you uh, relief across all of the, all of the borders. So I'm um, not going to spend much time on the EU directive part because Claudia already did that. But I'll just point out um, some of the, some of the, the similarities and, and some of the differences. Primarily, I think, because of the TRIPS agreement, both the EU directive and the US law have very similar definitions of what a trade secret is and, and what the obligation is uh, to, to defend it. Um, the US law, wanna, you need to have better eyes in order to read the slides that are down on the bottom. You shouldn't be an old person with glasses having to do that. Um, the US definition of a trade secret uh, talks about all for forms and types of financial, business, scientific, technical, economic, or engineering information, including patterns, plans, compilations, program devices, formulas, designs, prototypes, methods, techniques, processes, procedures, programs, or codes, whether tangible or intangible, and whether or how stored, compiled, um, or memorialized physically, electronically, graphically, photographically, or in writing. So you can see it's a pretty enormous uh, definition. It really can include anything that you as, um, as, as a proprietor uh, deems to be economically valuable if you keep it as a secret, and, and then if you take the necessary precautions. Why is trade secret sort of now so kind of of, of vogue? One would ask the question of why did the, the US and the EU at the same time both suddenly take up the, the issue of trade secret protection? And I can answer the question from a European perspective, but from a US perspective, um, what we were faced with, particularly in the area of software protection and business method protection, was, as you are aware, decisions of the Supreme Court in the United States that made protection by patents very vulnerable. Um, and suddenly, the idea that I can get this patent and I can rely on a patent simply disappeared. Uh, and trade secrets was viewed as an alternative. Um, and for that reason, there actually was suddenly a lot of attention paid to, to trade secrets um, in, in, in the United States, and I assume also presumably uh, in Europe and, and, and possibly the, the rest of the world. Um, so uh, what constitutes a violation um, of a trade secret? Uh, when you look at the, the violation provisions, it's kind of interesting because you see that both the, the US uses one set of terminology and the EU uses another, a different set of terminology. But in essence, we are saying exactly the, the same thing. Um, we, in the United States, we talk about misappropriation. In, in the EU directive, it talks about unlawful acquisition use or disclosure, but what we are really all um, all mean by by that is um, any kind of wrongful acquisition, use, uh, or or uh, disclosure. Um, and if you acquire a trade secret without consent, if you use or disclose the trade secret without consent, 
or if you breached a duty to disclose the trade secret, not to disclose the trade secret, or you breached a duty to maintain the secret, then um, you are guilty of, of a violation. The US law talks about what it means by improper, improper use of a trade secret. And improper includes theft, bribery, misrepresentation, breach or inducement of a breach of a duty to maintain secrecy or espionage uh, through electronic or other means. Um, the espionage part of the US trade, Defend Trade Secrets Act is kind of really interesting. Um, you would think that because trade secret protection is a type of intellectual property protection, it would be codified with the other intellectual property laws in the United States, but it's not. It's codified amongst the espionage acts of the United States, and it's actually part of the Electronic Espionage Act. And I guess that's a reflection of the fact that um, it, probably so many trade secrets are, are uh, stolen by, um, by hacking. What is also important in b both the US law and the EU directive are the exceptions to uh, theft of trade secret protection. They both provide for reverse engineering, for ind independent development, or any other lawful means of acquiring a trade secret. So it's not just that I suddenly have this knowledge. If I've acquired the knowledge lawfully, then obviously I'm entitled to do it. There is one difference that's sort of an underlying difference between the US law and the EU directive is that the US law tends to favor employers and the, and, and the protection of, uh, of the trade secrets. And the EU directive, at least from my American perspective, tends to respect the rights of employees and to ensure that employee rights, employee rights of freedom of movement are respected. And it does that uh, more than does the, certainly more than does the, the US law. Both obviously provide for, for remedies, and the remedies in case there is a violation of either the US law or the directive include damages for lost profits or for unjust enrichment, the payment of reasonable royalties for what has been taken, um, and preliminary and, and, and permanent injunctions. But the US law goes beyond that of the, the EU directive. Under the US law, you can get enhanced damages. You can get attorney's fees for willful or malicious violations or for claims made in bad faith. And you could also get in exceptional stand, uh, circumstances an ex parte seizure of the property that was the subject of the, of the trade secret uh, theft. And in that case, the property is held by the court until there is a, um, a, a determination uh, on, on the case. Um, as I mentioned before, the US law links trade secret theft with economic espionage, um, and it actually makes trade secrets, or bad trade secret thefts, racketeering activity. Um, racketeering activity is sort of like the, what the mafia does. Uh, it, it, you know, it's kind of like spying and, and all sorts of really evil, bad stuff. Um, but if, in fact, uh, it is considered to be bad stuff, the provisions of something called the Racketeer Influence and Corrupt Organizations, or RICO Act, comes into effect. And in that case, if there are damages, the damages are trebled. They're multiplied by three. Uh, and the aggrieved party's attorney's fees uh, get, get paid. Um, the, the EU directive takes a much more humane uh, and opposite approach. Um, it provides that remedies need to be applied in a proportionate manner. Um, it, it, it wants to make sure that 
the um, protection of trade secrets or the overzealous protection of trade secrets doesn't lead to barriers to legitimate trade and, and competition. And it also provides safeguards uh, for, for abuse. Unlike the US, it doesn't provide for en enhanced damages. Um, and it also allows member states to limit liability for uh, trade secret theft or for unlawful disclosure or acquisition or use uh, if a, an employee acted uh, without intent, um, simply not knowing what the, what the employee was, was doing. Two minutes? OK. Um, so I will just go super quickly through. There are also provisions, as Claudia mentioned, to balance the, the, the proprietary interests of, um, of employers with the ability of employees, having, particularly having signed non-competition clauses, to be able to have free movement, to be able to move from one position to another. Um, and suffice it to say that uh, the, the European directive, one of the differences, although in principle they are the same, however, the, the European directive gives member states a, a little bit more flexibility. They also both um, make provisions for what's referred to as whistleblower protection. Um, I am an employee. My employer is doing something wrong. I need, I, I, I want to report that my employer is doing something wrong, perhaps breaking the law, but in order to do that, I may have to disclose a trade secret. Um, the employer is tainting food, uh, but that recipe for that food is subject to a trade secret. In order to blow the whistle on my employer, I need to, uh, to be able to reveal that, that trade secret. Uh, again, both the EU directive and the US law make provision for that. However, the US law sets very strict limits on how whistleblower protection can take place and the EU directive is far more broad. In fact, um, if I'm an EU employee and I want to blow the whistle, I'm an employee working in the EU and I want to blow the whistle on my employer and I want to do it by going to an investigative journalist, um, I'm even covered uh, in that situation under the e EU law. There are other provisions dealing with keeping trade secrets confidential during litigation and also on um, statutes of limitations. There is one final thing that I want to mention, um, if, if, uh, if that's OK, um, because it's sort of a, a, a weird part of the Defend Trade Secrets Act. Um, and I, I personally find it a little bit funny, uh, peculiar, so I, I, I want to mention it here. Under the Defend Trade Secrets Act, um, Keeping in mind that as a culture, we are a little bit paranoid in the United States, the US Attorney General has to, every other year, prepare a report um, that talks about the scope of theft of US trade secrets occurring outside the US, the extent to which those thefts are sponsored by foreign governments, a breakdown of trade secret protections by our US trading partners, and recommendations on how to reduce theft and protect US companies. A little bit funny, um, but nevertheless, that's, that's part of the law. So just to, to, to conclude and to, to wind up again, to repeat that there is significant over, overlap, um, but, as, as Claudia pointed out, if, if you are, as an employer, going to want to take advantage of trade secret protection, um, the burden is on you to make sure that, uh, that, that, that measures are in place so that, in fact, you are keeping your trade secret secret. Uh, and that includes all of the measures that, that Claudia talked about before. Um, and I imagine that probably a, a more and more harmonization of this type is in the works for trade secrets. Thanks.